So continuing the S&T theme, um, it's a great pleasure to be able to welcome to the stage uh, Mike O'Callaghan. Um, Mike uh, joined DSTL in 2007 and uh, has had a focus on several different areas over the, uh, the time that he's been with DSTL, uh, starting with uh, novel materials, providing uh, technical support to the DSTL executive, uh, spent some time looking at comms and information systems, uh, and the development of new ways to work with SMEs, which I think sort of picks up on some of those, uh, those questions. So some of those questions may uh, appear again, I think. Um, Mike moved to DSTL's technical directorate uh, to implement DSTL's tech strategy before taking up his current role, which is as the lead of DSTL's space program. Uh, warm welcome, Mike. Uh, you are hopefully going to talk about the uh, space focus and priorities for DSTL over the next, next few years. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. I thought it was worth just spending one minute playing you that video to give just a flavour for the kind of things that we do uh, across DSTL, and I'm going to touch on that a little bit in a minute. I had the privilege of actually playing that video to 10 astronauts last week, including Charlie Duke, the 10th man uh, on the moon, and he said, wow, great video. So I think for me, that's a thumbs up to DSTL's comms and media department. Uh, so uh, as uh, Mark mentioned, I'm Michael Callahan. Uh, I run DSTL Space Systems Program. I've been doing that uh, for just about five years now. And I guess I spent a bit of time this morning um, telling you uh, a bit about our new program. We've restarted some activities this year where we fit into some of the things you've heard about, you know, over today and yesterday, but also uh, at previous events in terms of delivery of space commands, R&D activities. But actually today, I also want to focus on our longer term S&T pipeline. And actually, I was really, um, it was great to hear from Alex. And when he talked about how venture capital uh, has that funnel going from thousands of ideas and filtering them down uh, to the most promising. And that's really the system that we, that we have and we want to implement and we're going to implement within DSTL in terms of what we do uh, on space. So I'm going to take you through that in a minute. And I'm going to go in a little bit into detail as well, uh, maybe some of the things you've seen before, but a bit about how to engage with us as well um, and how to work with us. Uh, so in terms of our space program where we sit, uh, we have five S&T divisions within DSTL. You're going to hear from Dr. Paul Keeley uh, later on on one of the panels. Uh, and space sits within the cyber and information systems division alongside other programs such as uh, AI uh, and, uh, 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 and other things as well. Um, in terms of space overall, uh, in terms of DSTL's capability, you saw from the video we do an awful lot of things. We have 22 uh, strategic capabilities, and you can see where space uh, sits in uh, alongside all those other things. And for our US friends, you can think of us a bit like Air Pharrell. Instead of having two customers, uh, we have many uh, covering across defense uh, and national security, as you heard from Alex earlier. Now, we've also heard a lot about strategy um, it is exciting times. I've put up there the National Space Strategy, uh, how we can support um, that step change that we want to see by 2030 to become a meaningful space uh, actor and supported by uh, the Defence Space Strategy about how we're going to operationalise the space domain. But also other strategies have been published over the last couple of years around the integrated review, in term, including our science and technology strategy that was published by uh, the Chief Scientist's Office in MOD and Defence Science and Technology. But also other things looking at things like multi-domain integration 
integration. Um, and that includes space, how we're going to think about integrating space with other domains. And that touches on our program, uh, Minerva, uh, looking at how, how we can uh, interoperate across space, but how we can think of that as part of that wider MDI construct as well. But also that integrated operating concept, looking out to the future as well. You know, what sort of forces do we want to have in the future? How can we generate options within SMT to help the likes of uh, AVM Harvin, the Space Directorate, uh, and AVM Goddard's in, in generating those future options for the capability challenges they've got? Now, in terms of uh, how do we go from these strategic documents to distill out the S&T challenges that are most relevant to space so that we can make sure we invest the funding that we've got in the most uh, effective areas? Uh, well, over the last uh, uh, year or so, uh, all of the frontline commands across defense, uh, including Space Command of work as well, have been developing their S&T problem set uh, to uh, help uh, ourselves uh, at DSTL and Defense Science and Technology understand the sort of S&T challenges they want us to get after. Um, and uh, Space Command have let me share uh, the top line for some of these in terms of what we call their S&T problem book, uh, their S&T challenges. What are the areas that they would like S&T funding to be uh, addressed against. Uh, and I'm sure you can recognize many of these top line uh, headings um, out of the defense space strategy, which are the same things that we want to get after in S&T. Um, now, of course, these things are trying to look out to the future to address some of those capability gaps and challenges um, that we think might exist uh, down the line. Uh, so for space domain awareness, that might be looking further out to things like the challenges of operating in cis Luna. And we know that our uh, American uh, allies are investing in things like the cis Luna um, highway uh, patrol system, uh, which has been announced a while back. Uh, but also looking across to things like um, space -based, uh, future space-based uh, comms. Um, and this is really out, you know, thinking outside of Skynet, looking at things like optical communications. Um, we've got a demonstration mission um, that we're due to launch next year called Titania, which is looking at space-to-ground optical comms, but also thinking about how we can uh, use uh, optical links to maybe uh, get data back uh, to base or down to end users faster. Um, ISR, obviously we're investing a lot through Space Command uh, on ISR through programs like iStari, but you also want to think about novel sensors, things that might be coming in, in 5, 10 or 15 years time that might have a really big impact uh, on defense. Things like quantum sensing, which our future sensing program, another part of, uh, of the CIS division, uh, is looking at. Um, within the context of space control, we've heard a lot about assurance and resilience. Uh, and really, we're thinking about how do we make sure the platforms that we want to put up in the future are, are resilient to the kind of threats and hazards we might face, whether naturally occurring or otherwise. So thinking about how we can make sure we have uh, resilient uh, links, secure T, T, and C uh, the, for the platforms that we're, we're looking towards. Um, and PNT as well. PNT actually doesn't sit within my program. It sits within uh, our future sensing program, which I've already mentioned but where they're looking at alternatives to global navigation space systems such as GPS. So that's inertial sensing or, or other ground-based systems that might be able to augment uh, the access that we get uh, to, to those uh, space-based uh, systems. So lots of challenges that we've got uh, to address. Some of those will have funded activities against them. Some of those we might not yet be able to, to address. They might be things that we're going to pick up uh, in the future. Now, in terms of uh, our space systems program, and having restarted that on 1st of April this year and just had another look at our vision and what we're trying to do, um, really our focus is about um, developing those really investment options, those business cases for the future. Um, this is where we were in the previous integrated review uh, from 2017 up to 2020 um, through the science technology we were doing. It was understanding how those different technologies could apply to uh, defense, how they could form the backbone of uh, the integrated review proposal. And really now we're looking to restock those shelves. Actually, a lot of the good ideas we had over the last five years, uh, a number of those have been taken forward by Space Command. And so with our longer term S&T investment, we want to start to look at what are those next options and choices uh, that we want to present uh, to Space Command in a few years' time, work with them uh, in developing that. In terms of how we're going to do that, um, we've heard a lot about partnerships, about working with primes, SMEs, 
venture capital for, from Alex. Uh, and for us, it's about maximizing those partnerships, both cross-government, um, including with the UK Space Agency, who we've had a partnership agreement with since 2012, and we refreshed uh, a couple of years ago. But also, we have a mandate to maximize that contribution from industry and academia to both threats and opportunities. And I'll touch a little bit more later, as I mentioned, on how we're trying to engage with that wider, wider community. As I mentioned, the why for us is about that evidence, about S&T creating choices and options for defense in a 2025 timeframe to restock that shelf, but also, uh, as it says there, providing that proven foundation for future satellite systems and space architectures, and looking at next generation and, and generation after next uh, space capability. So uh, I, I do love this photo, by the way. This is a real photo in the background of some work we've been doing, and I'll touch on a bit on this later on La Palma with the University of Warwick, um, not too close to the volcano, luckily, uh, last year. Um, how are we going about doing that? Uh, how are we going about doing this? What are the key outcomes that we're trying to achieve from the program? Well, the first one is about integration. It's about bringing together, I mentioned those 22 strategic S&T capabilities across DSTL. A number of those areas are starting to look at space as a domain of interest. They're not areas that have traditionally looked at space, like our material science uh, program. Um, but they're starting to think about what are the challenges that they might want to address from a material science perspective uh, that pertain to space. And so we're looking to, to make sure against that problem set that I mentioned earlier, we understand what research is being done across the STL uh, that is relevant to address some of those space challenges. Equally, we know that we don't have all the good ideas. We're not funding, you know, within our limited budget, everything that uh, might be of interest to defense in the future. So we absolutely want to work alongside the large companies, the SMEs and the VCs, to understand where industry is going that might be of relevance to defense, <coughs> excuse me, and bring that into our program and engage with you down the line. Uh, that doesn't mean we're, we're going to fund all of that work, but we absolutely want to understand your pipeline and your R&D objectives uh, going forward. In terms of that longer-term research, <coughs> excuse me, I need a glass of water. Uh, let's go get that. Um, in terms of that longer-term research, no, oh, thank you very much for that for me. Um, of outcomes that we're delivering against, uh, budget rising to about 20 million a year in about three years' time, so an increasing budget from what we've had in the past. And I've mentioned already ISR, Space Domain Awareness, MILSATCOM. Uh, didn't expect to get hay fever uh, today. Uh, mentioned those areas already. But also we're working on things like understanding about future force. Um, we heard about, um, we heard from uh, General Emerson yesterday about uh, DCDC and the work they're doing. Uh, again, that's something that we've supported uh, from the space program in the past. But also thinking um, about kind of the future of uh, space and what um, the operational domain means, what war fighting means, working with uh, places like the Freeman Air and Space Institute, which DSTL sponsors with King's College and others, trying to understand some of that more academic theoretical uh, side of space as well. Um, and I'm not even going to touch on this too much, but obviously on the a higher TRL side, working closely with uh, Space Command on delivery of the Space ISR Earth Observation System of Systems, I, I, I Starry, uh, Minerva, but also some other demonstrators. I mentioned our optical comms mission already, uh, but also uh, space domain awareness, demonstration activities that we're conducting, funded by the Defence Space Portfolio and through uh, AVM Godfrey's team. In terms of our kind of key areas of growth that we've seen on the longer term S&T, uh, the, the higher priority for us is really looking at that freedom of action, which is about resilience. I mentioned, you know, secure comms, for instance, uh, and how we can make sure our future low Earth orbit small satellite platforms are secure and resilient, but also those generation after next space domain awareness concepts, and also on the MILSATCOM side, seeing some renewed investment in looking slightly further out, um, uh, obviously working very closely uh, with the sky Net 6 uh, team and Defence Digital. Um, so I'm just going to take you through now that kind of pipeline. How are we doing that engagement? How are we putting all this together to actually uh, deliver outcomes and, uh, and benefits? I already mentioned our integration hub on the left-hand side. 
We're uh, starting off with uh, kind of discovery activity, which you know, is uh, working with our defense S&T futures program to understand that future context. Obviously something that, you know, uh, if we look at what's happening over the last few months, feels like it's very rapidly changing. But we look at things like global strategic trends, where we might be in the future, and the, what the role of space might be uh, within those future worlds uh, and that future concept, uh, context. I mentioned about drawing in the good ideas from the uh, wider community. Um, I mentioned, uh, we heard about the National Security Strategic Investment Fund earlier, so looking at novel and new ways of working with SMEs. But also sponsoring things like uh, Seraphim Capital's uh, seed stage investment round, their space camp, we're on cohort nine at the moment, and we were with, with them last week to see the next nine companies that they're looking to take through that nine week, nine week cohort. And it's activities like that that help us kind of filter those ideas. As Alex mentioned, he was seeing thousands of ideas coming through uh, every year. Um, and when we look at that horizon scanning, yes, we will do, be doing some of that horizon scanning ourselves. We'll be working with partners across government on that, including the space agency, but also working with venture capital to understand where their uh, interests are, what they think are the most promising propositions coming through, and use that to inform some of our thinking. Um, also using methods, you know, through DASA, we have frequent DASA calls and we should be announcing the winners of our uh, Bravo Drop uh, Space to Innovate call uh, soon, which is focused around space main awareness technologies. Uh, but also we've done things in the past like International Space Pitch Day a few years ago now, but trying to look at slightly different ways of running faster to get after ideas faster, work more closely with the users. So we're trying to innovate in the process about how we do things as well to access those market uh, opportunities. But we, just don't, we don't just want technology either. It's great to have a widget that someone thinks is going to be the next greatest thing. We need to understand in that in the context of defense. Um, how could we employ that in the future? Is it something that's even feasible for us to use? And we absolutely want to challenge the thinking, but equally we don't want to follow rabbit holes that lead us off down a path for something that will cost billions that we'll never be able to afford. So we need to do some early, investment, uh, early investigations as well through operational analysis, uh, working with uh, users in Space Command to understand and the broad feasibility of some new technologies and ideas and whether they're things that we will be able to adopt in the future. As we kind of move through that pipeline, uh, we start to invest more money. We start to put things together into, into concepts that we could imagine uh, defense investing in. We've got a few examples there on the right of a number of things that we've uh, been working on. Um, some of those will be familiar to you because we've briefed them before. Things uh, like on the top line there are hyperspectral imaging concept um, called SICRAX, which has been looking at how can we make hyperspectral imaging uh, more affordable. These aren't small platforms. They're still quite large, uh, but they do get after some of the challenges that we're interested in. Uh, the middle images there are looking at how we can operationalize space environment systems. So this is really uh, improving our understanding of the Earth's upper atmosphere to improve our understanding of the impact of uh, solar events on space systems, but also being to uh, characterize those and model those better. And this is a picture in the middle uh, slot there of our CERSE mission, um, uh, which is due to launch with the US Naval Research Lab later this year. And at the bottom there, uh, you can see some of those images from La Palma, uh, which I showed you, um, which are in collaboration with the University of Warwick. Um, with their Center for Space uh, Domain Awareness. And these are sort of wide field of view cameras looking to uh, track very faint objects in geostationary orbit, obviously very important uh, to our Skynet system uh, in the future. Um, and we've done a lot of work in how we can repurpose or reuse astronomical uh, telescopes and other equipment uh, available to the academic sector and to universities in improving our space domain awareness capability. And the SDs are very much still in the S&T domain, but we're looking at how we increase the TRL of these and uh, pull them through working with Space Command to operational capability in the future. So as we get into that middle bucket, it really is starting to understand, okay, how do these technologies manifest into things that uh, defense could actually use? <coughs> You've heard about Prometheus 2 as well. I'm not going to spend too uh, much time on it um, because a lot of information is out there in, in the press release. Um, but Zion by Airbus working uh, with in-space missions who are doing the build. Really, this is all about interoperability, working with allies and partners as a precursor uh, to the Minerva uh, program. Uh, how can we uh, jointly 
do joint mission operations? How can we join up our ground segment uh, together with our allies and partners? Uh, and how can we operate joint payloads uh, with our partners as well? Um, so a lot in here, um, some really interesting uh, systems that are going to be launched on here, but the focus is that interoperability, working with allies and partners, which you heard a lot about uh, yesterday. Obviously, this has to be underpinned by academic, uh, scientific um, understanding and operational analysis. I'm not going to touch on it too much, but Dr. Gemma Atrell is here, who Lee is chief uh, space scientist who's running our space science project. And again, we're looking to see how we can broaden our uh, access to um, work going on in the academic sector through the research councils working with UKRI uh, to make sure that we're, we understand what research is already being done in the UK and how we can pull through some of those things that are relevant to defence into our programmes in the future. This will feed through into, you know, it's that down selection of ideas from our big funnel down to the most promising R&D projects uh, that get funded and get taken through uh, working with uh, Space Director and Space Command. You've already seen the ISTARI program slide. It's been briefed before. I'm not going to touch on it too much. Suffice to say that this really is a step change for us in terms of the research and development activity that we're doing um, over the next few years. Um, I keep miscounting, but by my count, we're because we have two missions that are two satellites each. We're launching four satellites uh, and uh, either procuring or starting a procurement of five satellites this year, adding up to nine in total, uh, which is quite a large, uh, large change from what we've done in the future. Uh, the core of all this, of course, isn't just what we're putting in space, but like Prometheus 2, it's that, uh, it's that um, architecture that sits underneath, working with allies and partners, working through our Minerva hub testbed to look at how we can uh, bring these capabilities together and understand how it fits into multi-domain integration. So, how are we working with industry and academia to actually deliver all this? Um, some of these things will be done through fairly uh, traditional procurement mechanisms. When we're looking to the longer term as well, we're looking at innovative ways of doing things. And we've heard mention from uh, AVM Goddard yesterday about um, uh, un, you know, learning from approaches like the uh, Space RCO out in the US. Um, but for us, this is all about building that enterprise approach uh, with industry uh, and with academia, which is critical to our success. I've used words up there about co-creation and collaboration. Um, you know, this isn't about us putting a contract out, throwing it over the fence and you coming back in, in three years' time with the output. It's how we can work together to, you know, in partnership to, to build these activities, how we can use some of these uh, activities to build, uh, you know, our suitably qualified and experienced personnel, but also to help uh, you, you better understand what's being uh, defence requirements and what's being done uh, in defence. Um, and we've got really good examples already of where we've, uh, under the contracts that we've placed um, for some of the missions we're already doing, putting our staff out into industry to uh, learn how you operate uh, and, and, we, uh, and reciprocating that relationship as well. I'll put a list of some of the benefits up there, and I hope they're reasonably obvious in terms of the benefits to you about you know, reducing your technology risk in terms of funding some of those uh, slightly longer-term projects. You know, the benefits to us as well are hopefully faster development. If we know where your plans are going and, and we can align things, then maybe we can get after some of these really pressing challenges uh, more quickly. A key one for me as well is the third bullet uh, from the bottom about uh, groupthink. You know, we certainly don't think we've got all the best ideas and we want to make sure that we understand uh, your good ideas and how they might apply to meet some of our challenges. I'm going to put a really busy slide up now. It is on our website, but I just wanted to put up there anyway. In terms of those 22 strategic capabilities, if you look across all of those, there are lots of frameworks and mechanisms in terms of how we put contracts out to industry, and I'm certainly not going to go through all of them. They're available on DSTL's website. Obviously, I've highlighted the space systems uh, one here, which is the Serapis framework, lot two, which is primed by BA systems. There are others as well. Uh, but really, it's kind of for uh, uh, space companies out there or people working in the space sector to say that, yes, you know, um, obviously a lot of our space work goes through that route, but there's also lots of other program areas within DSTL that are thinking about uh, their research in the context of the space domain. So there's other areas to engage with if you're thinking about, for instance, developing uh, AI and data science capabilities as one example. <coughs> I'm really uh, suffering uh, from that. Um, so I'm not going to dwell on that, but if you, if you look on our website, um, you know, there's a link there to how to see those opportunities and how to uh, become part of that wider supply chain 
uh, through uh, some of these uh, routes. Uh, but this obviously doesn't cover some of the things I mentioned earlier, like working with, with NSIF, for instance, and reaching out through, through other means. So we're also looking at new and novel ways uh, of, of doing things. And if you want to meet those programs, we actually have an event coming up, Supercharging Science, on the 7th of June at Newport. Uh, so do come and join that activity if you want to meet that full range of research programs within DSTL and hear about some of our, our research priorities. So to make sure I don't uh, run out of time, I'm just going to uh, summarise and then I think there'll be very brief time for Q&A, uh, looking around, Can't, uh, hope that's the case. In terms of where we're at, you know, very significant new investment for defence in terms of S&T uh, and R&D. As DSTL, we've got a key role to play in supporting the delivery of that ambition, uh, working closely with our partners in DNS, with Space Command, Space Directorate, uh, and more broadly, to get after that challenge of being a meaningful space actor uh, by 2030. Um, and I leave you with one picture, uh, which was uh, a number of years ago now, and I won't go into the details on it, but we have managed to get a payload, uh, at least, if not a DSTL-owned satellite, out of the International Space Station. That's a picture taken by one of the astronauts. So it's not our first foray into space, but it's certainly uh, an area that we're growing into uh, and getting after some significant challenges uh, over the next few years. Thank you very much. Uh, many thanks, Mike. And we do have a little bit of time for a couple of quick questions, I think, if there's anything from the floor. At the back here, please. The mic isn't on. Hi, Hi, Teresa Condor from Spire Global. I wanted to ask how you handle this so-called valley of death of going from innovation into operational capability, which I think is also a big theme of this conference. And, and often you'll have projects that run that show something interesting, and then it's very difficult to move it into I mean, real world use. And what, what role does DSTL play in helping make that leap? Yeah, so actually, I think, I think within the programs that we mentioned, you know, especially uh, think about the uh, Minerva, our Starry program, you know, we've actually got a fantastic opportunity to, to look at that. You know, it is obviously uh, an enduring challenge, not just within defense, but in, uh, you know, uh, industry as well, in how you transition out of R&D into, into operational capability. Um, but through the delivery of those programs, you know, we're not sitting in a stovepipe doing those, you know, within DSTL without talking to anyone. You know, that's very much in partnership with defense equipment and support, working, you know, on an almost daily basis uh, with the program team at Space Command. Uh, and that's something that is, you know, an active part of of, of that program to understand how uh, we move through the R&D phase and then you know, uh, that gets pulled through to operational capability in the future. So we're kind of taking a, a dual track approach to that in terms of some elements of the program are being contracted and run by DSTL. Some are being done like the Taiki uh, mission you heard about earlier uh, through DNS. And so we're kind of working that very much as a collaborative team uh, and trying to make sure things are done by the, the right organization at the right time. Obviously, there's lots of challenges there. Things that are R&D are not going to be suitable to be you know, used for operational capability. But I think you know, working very jointly together, we've got uh, every opportunity to make that happen. And looking at how we set up new mechanisms and frameworks <clears throat> through DNS, for instance, that can pull through some of our things beyond TRL6 um, post-2025 into that operational baseline. So there's lots of work going on to look at that. Um, you know, I'm really encouraged by, by uh, the collaborative effort that's, that's going on. And I think we've got a really good opportunity to kind of lead the way where we you know, don't have a capability uh, there yet on the ISR side uh, to pull that stuff through. Thanks. Final question, Tim. Hi there, Tim Robinson from Aerospace. Uh, Mike, what's thinking about kind of um, networks underlying a story uh, and a kind of idea of a space cloud or, or, or grid or what have you? What work is being uh, done to integrate that with the more terrestrial thing uh, uh, networks or clouds? I'm thinking here of the RAF's combat cloud. Is that, is that growing upwards, or are you, you thinking of merging the space cloud downwards? Surely there's going to be an integration problem when the two meet. 
Yeah, so, you know, to, against that challenge, I would say that we're looking to understand, you know, where the future MOD uh, baseline will be in terms of those operational networks. You know, at the moment, this is very much a test bed uh, that working on within Minerva, but we're looking to build that um, in the same way that we expect those systems will instantiate themselves uh, in the future so that uh, any uh, system or architecture design that we do can be uh, pulled across into those procurement programs in the future. So we're very mindful of the fact that there are other programs and activities uh, going on. You know, we've been to Farnborough, we've looked at what they're doing on things like AIX uh, and Combat Cloud, but also, you know, other frontline commands and the work that they're doing. So I'd say we're absolutely looking to learn from that. Equally, putting that chart up around Istari, we don't want to be in a stovepipe, but we do have a very big challenge as well of looking to understand how we're going to actually build the space component of that in the first instance. So we need to, we've done a lot of work to understand what those interfaces will be, but at the same time, you know, we do also need to focus on building out that space component and understanding what that is. And we, you know, we can't do everything at once. So yeah, engaging, but uh, also focusing on the space bit for now. Brilliant. We're going to draw stamps there. Um, uh, thank you very much, Mike. Uh, it's really interesting to see uh, just how much really very exciting stuff DSDL is getting its fingers into. Thank you very much for battling through um, <laughs> hay fever, which is a, an absolute nightmare. And when it attacks you in the middle of a uh, presentation, that's a, pretty much the worst time in your life. So uh, brilliant. Thank you very much. Um,